Hi guys, welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, welcome, I'm Brooke, and today I'm gonna to be doing a bit of a different type of video. I'm going to be doing beginner wine education. So if you guys have been following my channel for a while, then you may already know, but we love wine and we belong to a lot of wine clubs. So over the years, I've been asking a lot of questions, doing my own research, and really just learning a lot about wine. And I wanted to create this video to help share some of my knowledge with you guys. So the next time you go wine tasting or are drinking wine with some friends, you have some talking points to make it look like you really know what you're talking about. So let's get into it. So let's start by talking a bit about the difference between red, white, rosé, champagne, and sparkling wine. So of course, red wine is made from the dark colored grapes, whether that's red, purple, black, blue, it's made with the dark colored grapes. Then we have our white wine, which is of course made with green and white grapes. Then we have rosé. Rosé can be made exclusively from red grapes, or it can be made with a mixture of red and white. And then we have champagne. Champagne can also be made exclusively from red grapes or from red and white. Sparkling wine can also be made with exclusively red or red and white. So how is that possible? How are we using dark grapes to make light colored wine? So the way that works is that although the grape skins are different colors, the actual grape flesh and therefore the juice are actually clear no matter the grape color. So red wine technically is made from clear juice. So how do they get the color? The color is from the pigmentation on the skin. So first they gently press the grape and extract all of the clear juice and then they add the skins back in and allow the juice to sit on the skins for a pro prolonged period of time. So while the juice is sitting there, it absorbs the pigmentation of the skin as well as the tannins from the skin. And the longer they allow that juice to sit on the skins, the deeper the color and the bolder the tannins. Then once the winemaker is satisfied with the color and tannins of the wine, they will extract the skins and then continue the fermentation process with just the juice. For white wine, of course, the skin pigmentation is not so much a threat to the color of the wine. When it comes to rosé, because rosé can be made exclusively of red grapes, such as Grenache, Syrah, Pinot Noir, the way that they're doing it is, once again, gently pressing the grape, extracting the clear juice, and then they are once again adding back the skins. However, the difference here is that they only add back the skins for a very short period of time, oftentimes only a couple hours, and then they remove the skins once again. So during that very short period of time, the juice is extracting just some of the pigmentation, just some of the tannins, and then they're removing it. So that's how they're getting that beautiful blush color but when they're choosing to mix both red and white, they're often using the white grape of white Zinfandel. And then of course they're mixing with Grenache, um, Syrah, Pinot Noir, or they could use other grapes as well. But those are just some of the most commonly used grapes um, for rosé. So then they'll take the red wine that has been sitting on the grapes and has that pigmentation, and then they have the light colored wine and they mix it together and the light colored wine is going to dilute that red color and that's how you get the blush color when they blend it. So for Chardonnay and sparkling wine, the red grapes often used are Pinot Noir and Pinot Noir, or Muir, I believe it's pronounced, and then the white grape most commonly used is Chardonnay. So for that similar situation where they are gently squeezing out the juice from the grapes, however, for these wines, they are not allowing them to sit on the skins. So that's why when you pour it, it basically just looks like a sparkling white wine because they are not allowing it to sit on the skins. So how does champagne get the bubbles? So the bubbles are actually the carbon dioxide that naturally occur in, in any wine, really, when it is fermenting. So during the fermentation stage, carbon dioxide is created as, or transfer, or as the sugar is transforming into um, alcohol. But the difference is that typically they just allow the, car um, the carbon dioxide to evaporate out. With sparkling wine and with champagne, they find a way to capture it and they actually hold in that carbon dioxide which allows it to become carbonated. So that's how we have the sparkling wine. So now let's talk a bit about the difference between champagne and sparkling wine. So champagne and sparkling wine are very similar, but they are different. So back in the 1800s, technically any sparkling wine could be labeled as a champagne. However, since 1891, 
France was trying so hard to change that. So what France wanted was they wanted the exclusivity of the name Champagne. And that's because in France there is a wine region called Champagne and that's where the grapes were originally grown and where they wanted all grapes to be grown in order to be labeled true Champagne. So what they wanted is that if any grape was grown elsewhere, they could not use that name. They would have to call it a sparkling wine, not a champagne. However, in addition to growing all of the grapes in the champagne region, they also had to follow several um, very strict processes and qualifications in order to be categorized as a champagne. So even if all the grapes were grown in that region, if they didn't follow all of these different specifications, they also could not call themselves champagne. So they really wanted to keep the champagne name protected, but that didn't really go so well. France's next step was in 1919, in the Treaty of Versailles, they actually addressed this. However, the US didn't really care, and we did not obliged by this. But it also didn't really matter for the US because the following year in 1920, the prohibition started and categorization of wine didn't really matter because no one's supposed to be drinking anyway. It wasn't until 2006, you guys, that recently, 2006, that finally the US decided to acknowledge. However, the US was sneaky as always and they threw in a grandfather clause. The grandfather clause said that any winery producing champagne under the name of champagne um, before September 14th, 2015, keep in mind this was signed in 2006, they extended all the way to September 14th of 2015. And it, so if any winery was making champagne under the name of champagne or sparkling wine under the name of champagne before that date in 2015, they could continue to call themselves champagne even if they were grown, say, Napa Valley or something. So even when you see champagne in the store, just know that although that regulation is now in place, a lot of wineries got grandfathered in to use that name. But a true, true, true champagne is grown, has all of the grapes grown in the champagne region and follow the specifications. Any other wine that doesn't is technically what a sparkling wine is. Next, let's cover tannins. So I mentioned tannins a bit when I was talking about the grape juice sitting on the grape skins and absorbing the pigmentation and the tannins. So what are tannins? Tannins are found in grapes, but they're also found in a lot of other fruit. So if you've ever bitten into a plum that wasn't completely ripe, that kind of like, ooh, like sour taste, immediately makes you feel like you need a cup of water, immediately thirsty. Those are tannins. And in a grape, tannins are found primarily in the skins. So the longer the juice sits on the skin, the more tannins it is going to absorb. So why are tannins important? So when people describe wines as like big bodied or bold, typically they're describing two things. The flavor, of course, but also the tannins. So what makes it what makes tannins give the big body feel is that you can't just drink it alone. You're gonna wanna drink it with something. So many times you'll see these big bodied wines or heavy tannin wines paired with cheeses, red meats. They pair very well with fatty things because fat is what cuts through tannins. So in contrast, wines that have low tannins, those are those wines that are those easy drinkers, those table wines, the one that you can just sit down with a glass of and chat with people, enjoy a movie. Those are those really casual, easy, smooth drinkers that you don't really need to pair with anything. Of course you can, you can pair wine with anything. However, that's kind of the difference with the tannins. So now that we know that grape skins impact the tannins in the wine, what impacts the grape skins? So there are a number of different influences that impact how thick a grape skin will be. And I'm just gonna touch on three of them. So number one is of course genetics. So genetically, some grape varietals will have thicker skin. And an example of that would be Petite Syrah. And some grapes naturally have thinner skin. An example of that would be Nebbiolo. And genetically, 
some just will have more tannins, will have darker skin, and all of that's genetic. Now let's talk about the second one. The second one is more environmental, so temperature. So even if you had the same grape, if you were growing it in a slightly cooler versus slightly warmer environment, that's going to impact how thick the grape skins are. Now, of course, we're not talking about extremes here, okay? We're not talking about like if you were to grow it in the tropics versus the Arctic, okay? We're just talking about slightly cooler versus slightly warmer. So the grapes in the warmer environment are naturally going to have thinner skin. Again, if we're working with the same grape varietal, they're naturally gonna have thin, thinner skin versus that same grape in a cooler environment is going to have thicker skin. And it's gonna have thicker skin because the colder weather, it kinda has to fortify its skin to protect itself. So think of like dogs during winter, they grow like their thicker winter coat. And then during summer, the warmer grapes, they have, dogs are shedding their coat, they don't need as much protection. So that's where the warmer, uh, the warmer climates are gonna have thinner skins because they don't need as much protection. So of course, the thicker skins, darker color, all of that jazz, we are going to have heavier tannins versus the thinner skin. The third contributing factor we're gonna cover is water, or in other words, rain. So the more water, the more is going to be absorbed into the vines and fed into the fruit. So the more water, the bigger, juicier, plumper fruit you're going to have. So when you have bigger, plumper fruit or grapes, of course that means it's going to dilute the flavor in it, but also that the skins are going to be thinner because it's growing faster. Now if there is less water, then the grapes or the fruit, they're not going to have the opportunity to get nearly as big. So the juice inside is going to be a lot more potent, a lot more um, concentrated. and the skins are going to be thicker because they have not had to expand as much. So those grapes are going to create a much bolder wine and heavier tannins versus the bigger grape, plumper grape, that has more diluted juice and has thinner skin. So those grapes would make great table wines. Easy drinkers, nice, light, airy, so depending on even the environment that a grape is grown, it can really impact the skins, the color, the tannins, the flavor, and the intensity of the wine, just like how strong the flavors are. Next, I wanna cover another contributing factor flavor-wise for wine, and that is the wine barrel. So of course, wine is aged in a wine barrel. However, did you know that the wine barrel is a big contributor to the flavor. So of course, the barrel, the wood, you're gonna extract some of that flavor. However, it is so much more than that. So in with oak barrels, traditionally they're made out of French oak. More recently, American oak has kind of been getting their act together and American oak is picking up in popularity, but traditionally wine barrels are made out of French oak. And the way that they bend them into that barrel shape is they heat the wood. But instead of just heating the wood, they take that opportunity to add more flavor. So they offer toasts. So every wine barrel has a toast. And with those toasts, that's often where you're picking up that cinnamon, that nutmeg, that um, smoky flavor, the tobacco, that's often coming from the toast of the wine barrel. So when they're warming it and when they're bending it, they're also toasting the wine barrel and infusing with that flavor. And oak is porous. So the wine is seeping in and it's extracting out that flavor. And it completely changes the profile of the wine. So winemakers have to be very careful with tasting what their wine is tasting like and thinking to the future of how those different toasts could impact and add to the flavor profile. So typically a wine barrel is reused anywhere between three and five to seven years depending on the winery. So the first year that it's used, it's considered new oak. And the new oak is of course where the flavor is most potent. That's where it's grabbing a lot of the flavor. After that, it's considered um, old oak. And the old oak, of course, you know, the second, third time, it's extracting some flavor, but towards the end, it's not pulling nearly as much. It just offers more of like neutral 
flavors to the wine. Another type of wine barrel is a stainless steel wine barrel. And stainless steel is often used with like Chardonnays. And that's what offers that like buttery flavor in the Chardonnay. And not all Chardonnays use this, but most commonly they do. And it's just so interesting to think about all those different flavor profiles, how some come from, you know, the weather, some come from where it was, the Appalachian, it, the grapes were grown in. Some are the barrel, the tannins, how long they sat on the skins. And then of course there are so many other ways that a winemaker can kind of change or tweak the flavor. But I know I've hit you guys with a lot for today, so I'm gonna go ahead and end this lesson here. If you guys enjoyed this video, please let me know in the comments below and give this video a big thumbs up. I would love to do a follow-up video and dig deeper into what really makes wine flavors what they are, grape varietals and wine blends. Just really dig deep with you guys. So if you are enjoying this type of content, please let me know. Again, comments below, give it a thumbs up. Really helps out my channel and helps communicate to me what you guys are enjoying and wanting to see more of. Thank you again so, so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Happy sipping, guys. Talk to me, baby. I've been waiting for a lifetime. Just keep on